There's no secret. There's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent. Be still and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't going to happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health. Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. Of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell podcast. And of course, I am Jay Campbell. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual StreamYard studio. I think Paul is all the way across the world in his native Australia at the moment. But I'm joined, of course, by my good friend, Paul Wallace. Paul, how are you, my friend? Good, AJ. I'm fantastic. And how are you going? Uh, I'm much better that you and I are reunited. So I think this is actually now our fourth podcast together. Uh, and I have had you on to discuss three, I think. This is the third. I know we've done a couple of live streams too, but uh, of your amazing uh, Eden series, and your newest book, which I finished uh, actually now four months ago, but it's an amazing book. You obviously sent me the intro uh, of the book before it was in the public is Invasion of Eden. And I will tell all of you guys, uh, I'll have a link in the uh, notes when this podcast airs publicly uh, so you can read my uh, review of it on Amazon. But it's definitely, without a doubt, and I've read all Paul's books backwards and forwards, his best, best effort yet, ties a lot of things together. Uh, from, of course, he does an amazing job always from going into kind of the paleo uh, ancient times and paleo defining paleo contact. And he brings it and ties it in all the way up to today with the black ops and, you know, all the stuff that's going on behind the scenes and the government, you know, technical cover up of ufology or, you know, extraterrestrial or ultra terrestrial or whatever you want to call it, interdimensional visitors. And Paul, as I said, it is an absolutely profound work and you've just totally outdone yourself. And that's, that's saying a lot because all the other previous Eden books were amazing, but can maybe you can just share a little bit, you know, we were talking off air about how so far, you know, it's going the public acceptance of it. And just where do you think it goes from here? I've been blown away by the public reception of the invasion of Eden. It's the fifth in the Eden series, but it's been the strongest launch so far. So clearly my stalwart readers uh, are buying it and enjoying it, thankfully. But a lot of people are, are reading it as their first Paul Wallace book. And I think it's because of the interest that's been stirred up by the public stoush between uh, elements of the Pentagon and elements of the U.S. Congress over the secrecy around current, um, well, should we say the reverse engineering program uh, that the Pentagon has had in place for 70 years, working on artifacts obtained from UFO retrieval. So all that has been suddenly in the public domain in a way we've never seen before, not for 70 years. And so I think there are a lot of people saying, wait a minute, and they're running to catch up with what's happening now and trying to get some context. And it was my goal in the Invasion of Eden to provide a really wide context to say, actually, the program is a much, much longer story than just 70 years. And if you're looking for clues that we may have company, well, the clues extend much further back than 70 years. And if you want to know how our ancestors framed this whole experience, well, let's take a look at that too. Because if people are just coming into this topic through what they've seen, uh, say, from Tucker Carlson or Ross Coulthard, they may be asking the question, how worried should we be if we're in company? And I think that once we frame that question more widely, we're much better equipped to navigate what might lie ahead. Yeah, well said. Um, I mean, it's interesting because, again, all of your books have just, you know, an uncanny and a very unique perspective in the ability to tie, you know, call it prehistory. And you're able to tie, you know, various different viewpoints from different cultures from around the world. And, and again, you do that so well. I mean, all of your books are page turners. Um, but like in this book, I think it was really the first time that you really, not the first time, but the, one, the, the deepest that you went with taking, you know, the paleo contact, the ancient uh, information from, again, you know, just call it 
what I would say keepers of the sacred fire, uh, you know, the indigenous and the wisdom keepers and all that and all the information stories they have, and then really tie it into this, uh, as you said, you know, uh, behind, behind the doors of the secret government. Yes. Right? Well, you know, I, I felt I had to really, because yeah. first right. of all, so much had happened sure. since I published the, the previous book, The Eden Conspiracy. Sure. We've never seen information of this kind in the public right. domain before. I mean, to have a televised conversation, uh, a, a House Oversight Subcommittee hearing evidence about the location of retrieved craft, you know, right. entire craft, and uh, the non-human biologics uh, that have been retrieved, so on and so forth. I mean, this really is quite earth-shattering. And I was finding on a daily basis, people were contacting me who were watchers of the fifth kind on YouTube or readers of my books. And they were saying, Paul, what sense do we make of this? And so though I planned a little um, a pause and a gap and a rest for myself after the Eden conspiracy, I thought, no, I can't take a rest. <laughs> this is this is all happening right now, and I have to respond to this, hence right. the invasion of Eden. And it was quite a challenging book to write because I wanted to bring it up to the minute, but not in a way that means it's out of date in 12 months, but in a way that says, here's, here's the scenario, here's what's happening, here are the questions thrown up by what's happening right now, questions that are going to play out over the next decade, 20 years. And so there was a bit of a balance, and it's the longest book in the series so far as well, because it is tying the paleo with the current. And there were heaps of other things going on uh, in my world during this year as well that made it a very challenging time to write a book. But the urgency is there, and I think the appetite is there. I think more and more people are waking up to the topic that something is going on, that we have got company, and that we individually and our institutions and our governments have a lot of running to do to catch up with the state of play right now. What is the dynamic of current contact? Is it visitors? Is it oversight? Have we been annexed? Should we be worried? Is it a, an existential threat, which was the conversation had in that House oversight hearing, the questions from Tim Burchett, and Andy Ogles were all about military threat, military security. How should we be responding? Should we be worried or should we be excited? Yeah. I got to ask you, what do you think of Dave Grush? I mean, you know, a lot of people want to say that he is put there. You know, I love, I, I think I used in one of our previous podcasts, my grandfather used to say, you know, Jay boy, if you come upon a tortoise on top of a ramp post, Good idea he was put there. <laughs> <laughs> so my well, question to you is, do you think, because Dave Grush to me comes off as a very honest, hardworking, you know, military guy who wants answers. But then again, the, 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 the negative pessimistic side of me says, well, yeah, he's the perfect guy to put there because that's what everybody takes him for. And so he comes off as truthful, honest, you know, the, the old classic American uh, way, so to speak. I mean, so, I mean, do you think he is a little bit of truth, a little bit of error? And I know this is an opinion question for you. Well, uh, actually, it goes to another reason why, why I felt I wanted to write The Invasion of Eden. And that is because so many people, Americans in particular, are very, very skeptical of anything that comes out of Washington. <laughs> Okay, so uh, if, if people's default is I'm not going to believe a word that comes out of Washington, that might be a self-protection policy uh, to an extent. But if that's your only story, if that's the only lens with which you understand the world, you are going to miss important things. And that's really what I'm saying in The Invasion of Eden. So, yeah. yes, of course, at one level, Nothing you are going to hear from anyone who's ever signed uh, non-disclosure agreements right. on the basis right. of official secrets laws, nothing is going to be script-free. Everything that David Grush says or Ryan Graves or David Framer, anything that they say 
the parameters of what they're saying has been agreed beforehand by a group right. to ensure that certain disclosures are not made, that certain boundaries are observed. So the simple answer is yes, of course, he's the one who's been allowed to speak. And yes, of course, it's been determined what he's allowed to say. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that what he's saying isn't true. Right. It just means it's very carefully controlled and ring-fenced. And in fact, I think it adds to the significance of what we heard from all three witnesses, David Grush, uh, Ryan Graves, David Fravor, adds to the significance that everything we heard had been approved by Dotsa and Thomas Monheim, the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community. That's the group we're listening to when we hear this testimony. But I think what we're getting is real information, but with a lot of boundaries around it. It is speaking for a group and a very authoritative group within military intelligence that wants to push the conversation about disclosure further into the public. Now, I find that very, very encouraging, but it's not the um, entire view of the entire Pentagon. There are people within the Pentagon who think differently. It's a community of people. Some want more disclosure, some want less. And so after that hearing, there was pushback, uh, particularly from Sean Kirkpatrick, who was the director of, of Arrow, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, uh, lambasting the whole exercise of the hearing, saying the whole hearing was an insult to people in his unit, and that in his time, 18 months in the job, he hadn't found any evidence of a program, et cetera, oh, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Well, that was ridiculous because we've already heard from physicists right. involved in the program. We've already heard from Jacques Vallée, Eric Davis, Gary Nolan. They've told us what they're working on. And again, that's what they're allowed to say. So for Sean Kirkpatrick to say we haven't found any evidence was totally not credible because of what was already in the public domain. Uh, but of course, then we could watch, well, which story is playing better? And I think uh, what he said did not play well, and it's why he was moved on from his job and he was replaced by the Assistant Secretary of right. Defense, Kathleen Hicks, um, in a reshuffle. Now, some people, again, having a very skeptical eye on these things would say, was that actually the whole goal of the exercise? Because there's right. no... You actually write about that in the book. And you yeah, I do. People yeah. would say, why would Thomas Monheim allow this to escalate into a public conversation without a predefined end game in mind? And might the end game have been to move Sean Kirkpatrick on? Right. Well, I say, yes, that's entirely possible. But actually, I see that as a positive because right. it's the pro-disclosure group that seems to have made several steps forward. And we saw a, you know, a legislative, legislative attempt last year to try and force more disclosure, where some amendments were added to the, um, what was the National Defense? Um, um, it's not the procurement bill, but it's the one that uh, uh, green lights all the finances for defense. Yeah. Uh, and, and it failed because I just don't think you can outgun the Pentagon. You can't force them to do things through legislation. Our hope is much more that we've got this powerful group who are in a forward-leaning position with regard to the public knowing a little bit more. And it certainly won't be knowing everything there is to know. There are these tight boundaries around what was discussed. There were all these questions where the answer was, I can't answer that publicly. That would have to be in a skiff, a secure yeah. compartmented information facility. But we know what the information is that they will have been discussing since oh, in man. those skiffs. And it has to do with what's been retrieved, when, where from, where the craft are, where the non-human biologics are, who the people are who run the program, and who the people are whose job has been to keep it secret. We know that that information exists. It was all referred to in that hearing. And I think the next step probably in, in about 18 months' time, will be for a little more detail to emerge on that because I do think we're in a sort of two-step pattern of soft disclosure at the moment. I think that's what we're seeing. 
Yeah. No, so I would agree a hundred percent. So um, kind of a bonus. And I know, you know, you're, you're familiar with Bob Lazar, but I've been reading this book. Somebody sent it to me as guys like you and I, people send us books now and it's called Paranormal Parasites. And I think, you know, this guy, the chap that wrote the book, Nick Redfern. Are you familiar with his work? Well, I'm aware of Nick and Bob, but I actually haven't read any of their books. So you, might, uh, you froze for a moment. I know. I, I just said, I, you can hear me. I said, I think the bad guys are attempting to take down this broadcast. <laughs> oh, hopefully not. Perfect scheme. Maybe, maybe they've just clicked record. <laughs> it's still doing it. Oh, we have another, oh, we have another oh freeze. My God. This is crazy, man. Just, I've had amazing internet all day. Not uh, one reverberation. And you come just, on the bar. Just, <laughs> just when it's getting juicy. Yes. So you said you're not familiar with Bob. I just wanted to read this to you, though. Um, I know you know both of them. But th so this is just a quote from Bob Lazar, um, you know, that he picked up in this book. And, you know, Bob's obviously been in documentaries and, you know, his story is that for three months he was in Area 51 and, you know, employed by, I think it was Boeing as a defense contractor. And, you know, he was given the quote unquote information about the alien presence or extraterrestrial presence and stuff like that. But anyway, what he was said, and, and again, this all kind of jives with a lot of your research, but he said, he was briefed on the long and winding history of the alien presence on earth. And he was told that the aliens were responsible Again, the aliens, I mean, what group that is, I don't know, were responsible for the creation and development of all of the world's major religions, and that the extraterrestrial creatures come from a faraway star system. More controversially, the aliens that supposedly genetically altered various kinds of early humans, such as the Neanderthals and the Cro-Magnons, into what we, Homo sapiens, are today. None of this, Lazar was told, could ever be shared with the public due to the catastrophic effect it would have on the world of religion and the stability of human civilization. So I wanted to just bring that up to you because you're the guy who has you know, done all the research on paleo contact. And Yeah. Well, the what, reason I'm laughing is yeah. that uh, what he says can't be revealed to the public is what my books are all about. <laughs> Exactly. But uh, the reason I'm able to do that is that I'm getting my information from ancient narratives. It's not that exactly. I've raided Area 51 and I've got the uh, I've got the intel from their safes and their vaults. All this information is there, right, and available to us if we just take a pause and listen to ancestral stories from totally. all around the world. And literally, you can go to any country, any continent, and if you listen at the folkloric level, you will hear those stories that Bob Lazar is referring to there. The fact that we've had visitations in the past, there's been ET contact all through human history, prior to Homo sapiens, that there was some involvement in finessing Homo sapiens, that there's been um, an involvement in terms of um, progressing the human story and human civilization. But uh, as you pointed out, Jay, it's a little bit um, ham-fisted to always say the aliens, the aliens. Right, right, right. Because uh, I think we've had visits from lots of different groups, different from groups. lots of different places. And I think this becomes very clear when we listen to the traditional story and the experience of our ancestors. And so I, I really go into what you've just summarized in much more detail in my Eden series. But on yeah. the basis of ancestral narratives. So that's that's where I wanted to go with it. And I wanted to bring that up for you, or to, just to seg into the cam, you know, the guardian of the Molokai, you know, wisdom, the ancient knowledge of the families there. And, you know, he talks, and, and again, I know you have other various, um, you know, ancestral narratives in the other books, but in this recent book, he kind of talks about what a lot of people, you know, who are familiar with the UFOlogy lore and myths and stuff like that, um, about the, you know, I, you know, and obviously I just came from Billy Carson's uh, first episode, the premiere in Los Angeles a week ago. Was it last week or two weeks ago? Two weeks ago. And or actually it's three weeks ago. It'll be three weeks ago this coming weekend. Time is moving so fast. But, you know, the first series has both Matt and him in it, or first uh, mm -hmm. episode. I think you're in a future one, but, uh, and yes. I think you're actually speaking with Billy about it pretty soon, but, um, that's right. It's, it's kind of the narrative of the Anunnaki, right? 
you know, and I, I just saw Billy just did an amazing video about the Anunnaki and who they were. You know, it's titled God and Gods, and it's on YouTube, and a lot of people are talking about it. But the ancestors of, again, these uh, various uh, indigenous groups around the world, you know, have very similar stories. And uh, in both this book and, of course, your last book, you know, you, 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 you made a bunch of, I wouldn't call it, you know, it's your opinion, but obviously shared from all this collective wisdom that you've been able to source from talking to all these people. Like, do you have an idea who the Anunnaki really were from an actual like species perspective? You know, where were they humanoid? Were they reptilian? Were they a combination of both? I mean, when we start looking at Toth, we start looking at all these different figures from like ancient Egypt, you know, we have like the Ebis, you have all these different mythological beings, right? Where you have like combinations of human animals. And, and, and you know, we know all of these things existed from the glyphs and from all the stuff that you and Matt and Billy and, you know, various other people have researched. Like in your just hardcore opinion, what were the Anunnaki? Well, the Anunnaki, again, uh, it's a bit like saying the aliens. Yeah. Because uh, the word Anunnaki simply refers to the beings who yeah, came from that. the heavens. Yeah. Uh, and so that could refer to a whole range of um, types and species. And I think if we go to the Mesopotamian narratives, so the Sumerian, Babylonian, Arcadian, yeah, Arcadian. Syrian, yeah. in those stories, we've got layers and layers of history and prehistory. Uh, some of the stories they are telling us are ages old by the time they're recording them. Sure. Some of them may be uh, 5,000 years old by the time they're recording them. So, for instance, I think the uh, the story that Barossus tells, um, so this is the oh, Babylonian, Oannes and yeah, the oh, I'm, I'm cool. Yeah. My suspicion is that that's about 10,000 years ago, and it's talking about beings that on first inspection, were described as terrifying monsters, except they turned out to be uh, civilization builders and very helpful to humanity right. from the perspective of creating cities that are easily managed. And it's a bit of a story of light and shade, uh, as, uh, as I describe in the book. But I think that's sort of 10,000 years ago. And then we've got other stories in the, um, in the Sumerian corpus that I think take us back more than 200,000 years ago and to interventions Unreal. that were made then. And I think when we're getting into stories of the, uh, the tweaking of Homo sapiens, we've yeah. got story from that period and from 10,000 years ago. So I think there are lots of different demographics who've come at different times with different agendas. And this reflects in the biblical corpus right. as well. So I think some of these stories of um, El Shaddai and Yahweh are from that 10,000 years ago period. And then stories of Asherah are more than 60,000 years ago. And it's a different culture. It's a different kind of relationship with humanity. The before and after is different of that kind of contact. So I think there really is a whole spectrum. The Anunnaki and the Elohim of the Bible, it's a spectrum of beings who come from different places. The regions of space that seem to recur are the Pleiades, where our helpers come from. Sirius, right. helpers come from there. Orion, advanced beings come from there. But by the time we're getting to Orion, there's a bit more light and shade in what this contact felt like. Because yeah. some contact was colonization and exploitation. And some sure. was pure benevolent, let's protect and help these human beings. And I think getting that spectrum is really, really important if we're going to approach the question of current contact intelligently. How do we work out who is here in our best interests? Yeah. How do we work out who's best able to defend our interests? Because those are right. two different questions. Right. And who might we have to be worried about? These all these questions need to be in the mix, not just the binary, are they posing an existential threat or not? We need to get into more subtle conversation. Well, you also do a really good job in the book of, you just kind of just said it all there, you know, in amongst what you just said, but like they're here already. Disclosure has always been available to those who had eyes to see and ears to hear. Um, and as you said, it's like, 
what is if they if they're here already, both the good guys and the bad guys. I mean, again, you can look at the Star Wars analogy. You know, there's the light and then there's the dark side. And it's of course it's in all the mythological, not mythological, but the action comic books, you know, the X-Men and of course the Avengers universe. It's all the same. It's just bat battle for balance. Is because again, we're talking off air about that new video um, with Tucker Carlson and uh the, the analyst uh, that's in a, a very incriminating indictment of the United States and its foreign policy and what it's done uh, for the past 300 years. Could we make an argument that military industrial complex, and let's just call that the easily quantify it of the United States and say Israel, because Israel is a very mighty mil militaristic nation. And I guess you could throw in the UK. Uh, and some of the other close allies of the United States, are they the quote unquote ca uh, capital of the call parasitic or, you know, maybe service to self ETs or again, ultra terrestrial beings that have been here all along and that they're just kind of essentially ruling them from behind the veil. And maybe they are actually in front of the veil too. Maybe they walk among us because they have tech to, you know, shape shift or, you know, look differently. Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, because on the one hand, um, the military industrial complex is what enables and facilitates and maybe encourages all kinds of warfare. Right. And, uh, I think if we were to really make a study of that, it would uh, be quite chilling. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? How the world has remembered Dwight Eisenhower's warning in his yes. farewell message about yes. the military industrial complex. And I mean, he's almost naming specific corporations. <laughs> I mean, we are talking about Boeing and Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and Skunk Works. Yes. Um, these are the corporations that have an interest in war and an economic interest, an economic interest in their being wars, and then they, they equip those wars. And what President Eisenhower said was, we should be careful that we don't allow our democracies to be hijacked by those corporations right. so that our foreign policy is being driven by the economic interests of weapons manufacturers. I mean, you can just see how worrying and dangerous that would be. But then he also talks about the hij hijacking of the democratic ideal itself. He talked about the importance of protecting a way of life in which government exists in order to build roads for people to drive on right. and build hospitals for people to be cared for in and build, build schools for children to be educated in. And he suggests that the whole idea that government exists to serve the welfare of the people in that way could be totally subverted if certain corporations became too powerful. Right. I don't think it's too hard to see. That's exactly what's happened <laughs> in the time since Eisenhower. And right. what really struck me when I spoke to Cam, you mentioned Cam, the traditional healer, my friend from Molokai, when he talked about the ancestral stories yeah. about the Mo'o and the Kaunas and the Ahumanu, which is the Hawaiian version of the Anunnaki stories, he again wasn't talking about um, we should be concerned about UFOs in the sky or, or battles in space. The take home of all those stories were watch out for your culture being shifted away from a place where we are looking after each other to a place where we are atomized, all in competition with one another, in uh, artificially engineered scarcity, living on the basis of fear and individualism instead of living as a society. And in his own language, he was really repeating exactly the same scenario that Dwight Eisenhower described. And so I think if we're concerned about who we're doing business with right now, exopolitically, and whether it's in the interests of, of the majority of humanity or not, right. we should look at our culture. 
where has our culture been going? Where has it been headed for the last 50 years? Have we seen a lowering of a sense of society and compassion and fellow feeling? Have we seen an atomization? Have we seen um, people living in scarcity when the economy of our nations are at a high like we've never seen before? Because these are all the kinds of clues that, that the people pulling strings behind closed doors are not the people you want pulling those strings. And it raises the question of, are we doing business with the right people? Are the decisions that were made in the 1940s, so politically, decisions that we stick with now? Or do we need to consider afresh who is present who is supporting the human story? Who is present who can uh, support uh, a direction that will be to the benefit of the majority of human beings and not just to the benefit of the MIC. Yeah. Now, having said all that, I think it is unhelpful to demonize the corporations I've just named. Yeah. And I say that because of what we heard from Hamish Shedd. Just before Christmas in 2020, he made this extraordinary statement, published this extraordinary book, The Universe Beyond the Horizon. And in case anyone doesn't know, Professor Brigadier General Haim Ashed was for 28 years the chief of Israel's space security program. So it was his job to know if there was any external threat from moment yeah. to moment. He said that on the basis of his privileged information, his understanding is we've been in contact for more than 70 years that we're in collaboration with our visitors, that we are involved in research programs with them on planet Earth and on Mars. And the we he's talking about, that is covert government in the United States and Israel, and that they are waiting to self-disclose, but the moment they do that is the moment that we master space-time. The moment we really are able to reverse engineer the bits and pieces they've allowed us to pick up and we can create a space-time bubble and we suddenly can travel into stellar distances. When that happens, the relationship changes. We are part of the galactic federation is the language he uses, the community of space-faring civilizations. And the way he describes that suggests that there is actually a more benevolent kind of collaboration with the MIC going on. And so where I get to at the end of the invasion of Eden is saying we really ought to wish the MIC every success with its reverse engineering operations uh, because that belongs to all of us. That will change everything. The problem is, once again, there's an economic incentive built in to not disclosing those right. great leaps forward. And that's why I think we need as much scrutiny poured upon the program and what that means as possible. At the moment, we've got Tucker Carlson. At the moment, we've got my compatriot, Ross Coulthard. But we need far more. Yeah. We need the world to know and the MIC to know that we want to know where they've got up to. We want to know what they've achieved behind closed doors. I mean, publicly, we know that they are working with materials that creates, create a space-time bubble. Of course. That's in public. In private, how much further forward are you? Because this leap forward belongs to all of us. And I think we need to give courage to our Congress people. I mean, I mentioned two in particular, Tim Butchett, Andy Ogles. We need to give courage to all our congressmen and women who want to bring accountability to the trillions of dollars of public money that have been poured into this. And we want scrutiny. We want to know what, where we're all up to. And I think we need our journalists to know that we will support them as well, and our media outlets to know that we will consume all this information. It is, the story is getting bigger, it's getting more attention, but it yeah. really needs to go large for us to make the next step forward in a way that benefits everybody rather than just these particular corporations. I think it's coming. Um, as we were saying off air, I think that there's going to be uh, a, an impact event, if we can call it that, that is going to 
separate or bifurcate. I mean, I mean, it, it's almost Paul a bigger conversation around conscious expansion, though, right? Because there's a lot of people who still are asleep, right? And again, we're not proselytizing, as you know, better than anyone. You can only meet people where they are. You cannot attempt to awaken others. It's an act of spiritual, you know, de-evolution to attempt to proselytize and you know grab them and say, "How can you not wake up?" Can you see this? Yes. No, all and, the stuff that's going on. And I think connected with the, the, the being asleep is being afraid. Exactly. Uh, I, I think yeah. if, because there are people who will just say, well, I don't want to know. That's but, right. Know, I'm sure they'll tell us what we need to know. And that, that's, that's how they want to live. But I think the problem with that is that if we are in fear, then we can be manipulated. And um, that's right. there's no way our governments or covert governments are going to willingly share more information if the population is easily triggered. Exactly. Now, I happen to think that um, recent research is, is, is positive as to what the public reaction would be to more disclosure. Recent polling in the state suggests that if the public were to be told we've been in contact for more than 70 years, about 67% of the public would say, yes, I'd more or less work that out. So I don't think we're looking at the blind panic scenario, such as, right. you know, we see in the three body problem, but I right. think we need to move the conversation forward in a non alarmist way. I think if we're just having conversations about existential threat, military security, that's very, very unhelpful. We've got company that is actually exciting, but we just want to make sure that this all moves forward in a positive way. And I think we need to remember the kind of courage we've had in, in the past when there were moments of progress in the great endeavor towards democracy. That's the kind of courage we need right now to push the story forward. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because it seems like Hollywood entertainment complex, celebrities, you know, Sports celebrities or sports entertainers, you know, from singer entertainers, you know, that whole side, whatever, whatever you want to call it, the socio, socio Hollywood industrial complex. Those people, for the most part, you know, there's outliers, but most of those people are bought and paid for. So you're not going to get, you know, whatever deal they have, they're under, like you said, NDAs and, you know, legal ease and disclosure agreements and whatnot. So you're not going to get from them. Because a lot of people think that it's going to be Joe Rogan. And, you know, Joe Rogan is an actor. I mean, at the end of the day, Joe Rogan, for all his fame, is an actor. That's how he made his start in this thing. So I don't see it coming from him. But, you know, thankfully, there is Tucker Car Carlson, the, uh, the other guy that you mentioned. And there's others. There's others of, you know, lesser magnitude that are out there. But you're right. It's going to take a collective effort of people continuing to champion these ideas, championing this data, these data sets, championing the information. I mean, yeah. we're all essentially, uh, you know, citizen journalists. Yes, and, we you know, are. Yes, we are. And people are picking things up. So if are. I can give, give a parallel, um, the United Kingdom uh, struggled for a long time with the troubles in Northern Ireland. Right. And uh, for a very long time, the constant message from uh, the government in Westminster is we don't talk to terrorists. Right. So there would never be any dialogue. There would right. never be any listening to what local concerns might be. That would right. end of story. And then finally, uh, I think it was in the 1990s, uh, Jerry... Um, Oh, I've forgotten his surname, but but the the leader of uh, Sinn Fein, which is the political arm of the IRA, steps forward right. and says, "Actually, we've been in conversation with the government in Westminster for a couple of decades." And everybody heard that and said, "Yes, I thought so." And they recognised it before the government stepped forward and said, "Yes, all right, yes, we have been talking to them," and in fact. The public reaction wasn't horror and outrage. It was relief yes. because finally we could see there would be progress because there was now conversation, intelligent conversation. What are the concerns? What will be satisfactory to both sides? The conversation that should have been happening for ages 
and the public were relieved when the taboo was busted. And I think there's a lot of people, I think maybe it's that 67% who will actually be relieved when the story comes out. We are in contact and we are exploring these things. I, I think the idea that there's going to be blind panic the moment there's dis official disclosure of contact is ridiculous. And I think the authorities know, which is why where we're at right now is only one degree removed from that kind of official admission. Because if you think about who were the people that we've heard from who are saying we're in contact, well, it's the former chief of space security for Israel. It's the former chief of French intelligence, Alain Jouillet, etc. Just the former... Um, Minister of Defence for Canada, Paul Hellier. Oh, it's just in one degree just... removed. Yes, he died quite recently. Yeah, and all these people have been allowed to speak publicly without consequence. I mean, you could say Chris Mellon is another example of that, the sure. former Assistant Secretary of Defence for Presidents Clinton and George W. Bush. So it's only one degree removed from that official statement from the person in the position right now. But for my money, that's pretty close. And that's yeah. why I see it as being a process of uh, soft disclosure. They're allowed to say these things without consequence. And I think people need to understand what it looks like when the Pentagon makes an announcement. Because it isn't the leader of the Pentagon stepping up to a microphone with all the press present. It is people like these making statements and not being imprisoned uh, or worse. That's yeah. how you get information out of military intelligence. That's what disclosure actually looks like. Yeah. I mean, one other question I want to ask you, uh, well, it's really twofold. Um, so we have right now, again, in society, essentially two groups, right? We have just call them the transhumanists, you know, that want the man machine merge. You know, they talk about the singularity and, you know, all that stuff coming, hooking everybody up to the metaverse. You know who those people are. I don't have to name their names. And then you have people like us who are like, oh, no, we want to preserve our humanity. We want to preserve our spirituality. We want to preserve our organic human nature. Um, and, and Paul, the truth is, is that the people that are talking about the singularity are talking 2030. I mean, you know, you got Peter Diamandis, you got Ray Kurzweil. I mean, they're all out there giving defined timelines. Whereas, you know, the other stuff that's going on with, obviously, we think that there's going to be, you know, much greater than soft disclosure, which has obviously always been ongoing, but some sort of, again, come to just call it a come to Jesus moment, literally and figuratively. Um, do we really both see this happening? I mean, I know that I do, but I mean, Paul, I, I see something monumentally shifting consciousness on this planet, this frequency of this planet shifting within five to six to seven years. And again, it's got to happen because all the transhumanists are saying that singularity happens by 2030, 2031. Yes, I think a shift is coming. And of course, everyone is hoping it's the kind of shift they want. Right. Uh, so the transhumanists are, are hoping for the singularity uh, and that kind of a shift. I'm sure that 1% one, 1 have the things in mind they'd like to achieve in 2030. Right. I think we have other helpers here who are seeing that, and I, I sense we're already in this, that we're actually at a moment where human beings are going to become more conscious, more yes. awake, more aware, more intelligent, and are wanting to nudge us all in that direction. I think the number of people who are having uh, profound and positive contact experiences. I think that's happening at a rate like we've never seen before. Yeah. And my hope is that the future is not set in stone, uh, that we have these different agendas, uh, some better for humanity as a whole and some not so good. Right. I am optimistic that we're going to see a positive shift because the ancient helpers have never gone away. I think those supporting a positive change in the human experience uh, outnumber the others. But the more awake we are now, the more conscious we are now, ahead of 2030, the better equipped we are going to be to make intelligent and positive choices in that moment. 
And again, I think if we're in a state of fear, that's when we can be managed. And that's when, um, if we're in a state of fear, that is the kind of scenario in which people who want an easily managed population uh, are going to leverage that, you know, whether through war, whether through a disease, whatever it is, you know, the, uh, the fix, the fix will simply be the thing that they're wanting to bring in. We're vulnerable to that if we're afraid. We are vulnerable to that if we are ignorant of what our ancestors told us. So I'd encourage everyone listening to go and read the story of Oannes and the Atkalu and the urbanization that they produced and the um, systems that they produced for managing dense and large human populations. Read that story and then look at our own world through that lens. That's probably all you need to do to equip you for all the choices that will face us as a whole, as a collective, in and around 2030 and beyond. And this is why I'm such an enthusiast for Ancestral Story, because in one way or another, we've been here before. We've been faced with these kinds of issues and struggles before. Let's learn from our ancestors so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past and can chart a way forward to a better human experience, not a worse one. Beautiful bonus question. Do you think, because that was a great answer, but do you think it's possible that both sides could end up c continuing to exist and that we would actually build two essential parallel but bifurcated societies slash realities slash timelines here on Earth? <laughs> well, that's a really interesting question because of how many times that scenario has been prefigured in film law or, or TV law. Right. Uh, so, I mean. In your uh, eyes, the, what is it, the Eloys and the Morlocks? Yes, that's right. That's a great example. That's right. Where you've got essentially, you know, the population living free and then the population living controlled. In the Star Trek universe, you've got the. Um, what's it called, the United Federation of Planets? Is that what it is? Yeah, Planets. Yeah, called? United Federation of uh, Planets. Which is everyone coming together, trying to find a positive way forward of co coexisting in the universe, learning from one another. And then you've got the Borg. The Borg. They just want to assimilate everything and run hive everything mind. and machine eyes everything with the hive mind. I think that's a very good illustration to put before human beings and say, take your pick. Which one do you want? Which one do you want? That's right. It's crazy to think that it's possible that that's, that, that, that you know, because we see, both of us see the same thing. We both see positive outcomes. We're seeing so much positive change. We're, we're living truly in a quantum reality right now. Again, if you're living in residence, um, you, Paul, I mean, I know you're seeing it. We're all seeing, it's almost manifestation at the speed of thought. But if you're living in dissonance and fear, it's the opposite reality. So you could you could make a good argument that the new earth is born out of resonance and people collectively, you know, banding together and raising their consciousness. And the third density slash third dimensional hyperdimensional control matrix earth just continues to meander on until, you know, a disillusion or, you know, dis destruction. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, you think about the Jesuit uh, you know, predictive programming stuff about the end times and the rapture and, you know, all that stuff. I mean, what if both actually come true? It's possible. Yes, it is possible. And I think the, just the mere existence of many of the ancestral stories I write about in the Eden series suggests that this is a perpetual struggle, right? That there is always a decision to be made of buying in or buying out. Right. Uh, being a good, you know, imperial citizen, or being uh, a rebel, uh, being self-sufficient, or existing to serve superiors, I, I think in some way, shape, or form, it is a perpetual struggle and a perpetual choice. But I do think we're coming to a pivot point where the potential is there for us to go into an era uh, of much happier life for human beings, and that's where I end up. In, in the invasion of Eden, showing that actually there have been these times before, times of hardship, times of manipulation, 
times of survival and times where we have learned to work for each other instead of working for the higher ups and build our cultures from the grassroots up rather than from the edicts of kings and queens and the 1%. I think these kinds of choices are always available to us in one way, shape or form. Once again, man, another amazing podcast. So um, everybody that is watching this amazing um, show today, and again, one of many that I've done with Paul, um, you can support Paul by going to his website, paulanthonywallace.com. He's also got the fifth kind um, YouTube channel, which is an amazing channel. You can also find him on all G I G at Paul underscore Anthony underscore Wallace. And of course he's on Facebook. Does Facebook still exists, Paul. No, I'm just kidding. No, I, I, it is. It does exist. I am there every day. I do talk I to people. I know. You're going to laugh at this. The only time that I ever go on Facebook is to comment on your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that, that's a good reason. It is a good reason, but my wife is on Facebook all the time. We always have like a running joke um, between us about like commenting on Facebook. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, I mean, amazing podcast again here today. So when will you be in Florida? You're going to be in Florida later this year, correct? Yes, I'm planning to be in Florida at the beginning of August. So uh, that awesome. might be a good time for another conversation, eh? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and if you're going to be down in Fort Lauderdale with Billy, I'll just come down and visit you, you know, depending Great. on your schedule. I just was with Billy and um, his wife recently. So we're good friends and stuff. So we'll talk, we'll talk off air, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, always, as always, please support the amazing uh, individuals that come on the Jay Campbell podcast, support Paul, follow him on IG. You know, you're probably mostly my, most of my people are already subscribers to the fifth kind, but please pick up his book on Amazon. It is such a amazing book. All of the Eden series is an amazing book. I mean, the workers, it's just, it's, it really is inspirational to read all of them. You know, I actually have it. I purchased it recently. That's, yeah. I pulled out this book, The Epic of Humanity. Your book is somewhere here. I've, I've got, my, got my copy here, The Invasion of I read, I read the PDF. Yeah. I read the PDF earlier in the year, but um, I did order the paperback. Uh, I don't know when it was. It was probably like a month ago. I've been traveling so much, I haven't actually even picked it up other than put it on my bookcase. But um Please, uh, people, read books. It's so important today to continue to read. So many young people do not read today. They watch five and 10 second video clips. And it's so important to carry on the tradition and to understand the sacred wisdom that has been handed down to us by reading books. So it's a, such a passion project of mine to encourage people to read. And again, if you're looking for an amazing book to read, it's obviously Paul's Invasion of Eden and of course, all of the books in the Eden series. So remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see all of you guys very soon.